We are here to celebrate, let's, let's call this the first, the kickoff of the 25th anniversary of Batman the Animated Series. I say for the rest of the day because I am going to bring out our two primary guests, Batman and Robin themselves. <laughs> You've heard him recently in Batman Arkham Knight. He's been on every damn TV show you've ever seen. You can't turn on the TV without seeing him on Parenthood or Bones or NCIS or Criminal Minds. If you watch Rock and Roll High School, you'll see this man in it. Lauren Lester! You probably don't remember much Search for Tomorrow, do you? Anybody <laughs> Search for Tomorrow fans? Oh, we got one back there! This is very cool. Do you remember playing Ted Kennedy at Kennedy? You remember Murphy Brown? Yes. Good job. Then you must remember him as the voice of Batman himself. Wait, say it with me. I am? I am. works. 
And um, it makes it much richer, it makes the characters much richer. How did the rapport break down for you two? I mean, you two pretty well came up with a pretty instant chemistry, right? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, we both have theater backgrounds, so we had that in common right away. And uh, we both were uh, primarily on-camera people. Uh, I had done some voices. This was my first voiceover job. But uh, most of my background had been on camera, so we had that in common as well. And it was just, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, we always had, I always looked forward to those sessions. Yeah. I think, I think Andrea Romano had a lot to do with that because she started out in theater. She started out studying theater. Um, she realized she wasn't going to make it as an actor, so she got into directing and casting. And she, because of that background, she really likes actors. And you'd be amazed at how many people in the business don't like actors. <laughs> there's, a, there's a real resentment among a lot of uh, people towards the actors. And Andrea loves actors. And she likes to cast actors who bring their A-game and bring a very positive attitude. So there's no bull, and there's, there's not a lot of tolerance for bull. Um, and she, if, if someone was disrespecting the other actors, they wouldn't come back. So she only brought very positive energy people into the studio. Did that ever happen? Uh, there was an incident that I'm not going to name the actor. No, don't do that. But <laughs> someone didn't come, didn't come, didn't come. We waited, we waited, we waited. Uh, uh, you know. And uh, <laughs> 20 minutes went by, 30 minutes went by. Finally, he said, I'm going to say, so look, we're going to record the show without him because so we got to get it done. And as we were rapping, they came running in and said, oh, I just couldn't get out of the house today. <laughs> and everyone was like, can't you lie better than that? <laughs> uh, that person never came back. <laughs> Lauren. Yes. You came in 19 episodes into the series. I did. Was there any intimidation factor at that point? I mean, there must have been a cohesive group. No, it actually was a, a, a joyous relief because uh, we had done the pilot together and uh, there was a different uh, Alfred and a different joker, I don't know if we knew that, but uh, Clyde Rebel was uh, Alfred and uh, Tim Curry was the joker. And uh, we, we did the pilot. Wait, 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 are you lying because you got stuck with Mark Hamill? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're saying they like both of them. Okay. But uh, we did the pilot and uh, then I didn't hear anything for a long time and my agent found out, well, they're, they're going ahead and they're recording the show, but they replaced the Joker and they replaced Alfred. I said, did they replace Robin? <laughs> I said, no, they decided to do the show without a Robin. They don't want a Robin in it. So I was really, really devastated. And then they called, I guess you said 19 episodes into it, and said that I was going to be part of the show. So it was just joyous to be there and so happy. Tell me about Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Oh, um, what a gentleman. The, Ephraim was really old school. Um, he was just so courtly and uh, professional, um, fatherly. Um, so the relationship I had with him was, was so appropriate for the characters. Um, he had a very paternal instinct towards me. Um, I, I had a great admiration for him. And oddly, I, I studied at Juilliard, and uh, his daughter, Stephanie, uh, was in the class right after me. So I knew her from New York. And uh, so there's a little bit of that background there, but Effie didn't know that. <laughs> and and his, his nickname was Effie. I mean, this guy is very courtly gentleman. He liked to call me Effie. So that was very interesting. <laughs> And, and he was a big icon when I was a kid because he was the star of a show called The FBI. Oh, yeah. And they used to say on the beginning, The FBI. You know, they would announce the, yeah, this week's guest stars. They would list the guest stars. And I grew up with that show and was so uh, in awe when I walked in. There was Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Andrea Romano, what was it she brought to the table that really what? I mean, the casts were unbelievable. But when she's communicating to you guys, how does she get that particular performance? There's a thing about dealing with actors where 
uh, you may or may not be aware of it. If, if you just give someone a line reading, the instinct is to just give them, this is what we want it to sound like. Ba, 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 ba. Well, all they're going to do is imitate you. And it's always going to sound like them imitating you. Whereas what you want is their organic version of that line. And to get that, you've got to give them the motivation behind it and hope that they get to the line reading you want. You know what I mean? You're kind of trying to guide them with the right thoughts to get to where you want the line to be. Because if you just give them the line reading, it'll always just sound like someone imitating you. So Andrea's great at talking to actors. She's great at putting it in actor speak. How, how you motivate the actor. You know, he's coming out of there, he's coming out of there, he's doing this, he's doing that, he really wants to get there. And she'll give you the motivation, and then you use your voice to get to the right color. And I've seen her, as I was saying, she, she loves actors so much. There was an incident once where um, she, she worked with the actor, she worked with the actor, she worked with the actor, and he kept giving the same reading. And he thought he was changing, and he wasn't. The rest of us could hear. It was the same. It wasn't changing. And she kept trying to get him to change it, and it, he just got stuck in a pattern. She said, fine, we'll come back to it at the end. So at the end, she came back to it. She did it again. She said, great, great, great. Wonderful. Congratulations, everyone. It was great. Great show. Uh, Kevin, would you stay for a few minutes? I have to, some notes for you. So I go up to her and she says, what's your schedule like this afternoon? I said, what, why? What's going on? She said, well, we have to bring in another actor to replace that, that, that actor who just didn't get it. And I didn't want to embarrass him in front of everybody else. So we're not telling him. But there's another person coming in and says, can you work with them? And that's the way she was. She, she respected actors so much that she wanted that person to feel like they had, you know, accomplished something that day. Um, so she's great. I can't say enough about how Andrea works with people. You guys have a favorite guest actor that came through? Somebody that impressed you so much, or, or, or had a fanboy moment of your own? Well, I have West as the great host. Oh. Oh. And he came in. And he came in. I had that kind of fanboy thing of, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm stepping on his cape, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Hi, uh, how do you do? Uh, Mr. West, you know? <laughs> and he said, um, oh, you know, have a good time. I had a great one with it. You all have a great one with it. Just have a blast. It's a fun character to play. And he was wonderful as the great host. Um, and I see him now at Comic-Cons so quite frequently. And uh, he's, he's still such a gracious guy. He's, he's just a good, good person. I love working with him. Too, too many to, to, to mention, but one particular that I love working with is Paul Williams. And as a penguin, and this, you have to understand, this was a guy who was an iconic songwriter uh, long before he started doing the, so I was a fanboy about that, like, oh wow, you're the songwriter, but he was so great in that part, he was so great in that role, and I love working with him, but that's just like one of a myriad of people. And John Glover? John Glover was great. Yes. And, uh, and Asner. It was yeah. an amazing cast. Who was the better McDowell, Roddy or Malcolm? <laughs> Roddy. We like Roddy. That, I mean, there, there was a guy who was a, a legendary child actor from the golden age of Hollywood. Yeah. So imagine how exciting that was to work with him. Harley Quinn, and we can see her evidence through the audience. <laughs> yeah, right. And it has, she has her roots in your series, courtesy of Mr. Taylor Dean. Were you guys, what was your initial reaction to reading Harley Quinn being added to the, to the universe? And well, she just, originally came in as a guest. She right. was just a one episode guest uh, character. But Arlene Sorkin was so outrageous. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. For, Anyone can imitate, not anyone, but many people can imitate a voice. But it's getting the idea for the voice to begin with. That's the inspiration. And there are lots of people who can do a good Harley Quinn as Arlene Sorkin did it. But Arlene
wise one came up with that idea for that gum chewing, grassy, broady kind of noise that comes out of that. <laughs> it's just such a great character. She had the idea. Um, so that, that's inspiring. That just shows great talent. And that's always exciting when that happens. It's happened to all of us in our careers. When we go in and we do something, we think it's oh, just for a day or a week or something, and it becomes a recurring you know, big deal. And it's very exciting when that happens. The producers obviously see something and they, they run with it. You know. When I went in for this, I originally tried to, I was trying to, you know, I was meeting all these people for the first time. I'd never done animation. And I said, you know, well, who's going to play Bullock? Who's going to play um, Commissioner Gordon? You know, I can do a good book. Wouldn't you like me to do book? I was trying to sell myself as a character. And Andrea pulled me aside and said, Shut up. <laughs> we want you for Batman. <laughs> Don't you get it? You'll be in every episode. <laughs> I said, yeah, but Bullock is such a fun character. She said, Shut up. You're going to talk yourself out of this role. Thank God. She <laughs> That's a good point, though. You came out, I mean, you had Juilliard, you were on camera, and you've really grown into primarily a voice actor with a huge... Uh, Look, I'm so lucky to... I, I mean, I'd love to still go on camera, uh, and, and, and I think every actor loves to be on stage more than anywhere else. But you can't make a living on stage. It's really impossible. And as you get older, um, the on-camera stuff just doesn't get offered to you anymore. I think Quite we should have been an on-camera Batman. Oh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> it's still fun. You're damn yeah, right. <laughs> but so, you know, to have this second act is incredible. I'm very grateful for it. It's, it's amazing to, to have this all be going on now. And the wonderful thing about voice work is your voice doesn't necessarily age. Uh, the way your face does. And believe me, someone came up today with some screenshots of me from Dynasty. <laughs> I was hot. <laughs> I mean, I thought, wow, that guy looks like a movie star. What happened to me? <laughs> but I sound the same, so I can still work. You know, people coming up to us uh, at the booth, and we talk to them, they, they just are so stunned. They say, oh, you have the same voice. You know, why, why isn't the show on now? You can still do it. And we agree. And <laughs> Paul, what the brother is? No, I said, put, put it out there. I said, but seriously, put it out there on social media because they do pay attention we to that. We'd love to do more. We'd love to do more. Hashtag original voices. Yeah. Hashtag original voices. <laughs> Hashtag president of show business. What is his name? Not me. Not me. <laughs> uh, Lauren, was there any uh, differences in, for you when you transitioned from Robin to Nightwing? Yeah, that was a great transition. Uh, 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 Andrea was very mean to me. She called me up and said, she said, Lauren, I have some good news and some bad news. She said, the, the, the bad news is you're not going to be Robin anymore. And I was like, what? And she said, the good news is you're going to be Nightwing now. <laughs> but but uh, Nightwing was such a, a more fleshed out, developed uh, you know, man on his own. Robin was always struggling as a sidekick. Uh, Nightwing became a man on his own, so I was able to have a more mature version of the voice and attitude that I had as Robin. And I actually took a, a cue from, from this guy because I thought, well, Nightwing is moving toward being the next Batman, as you know in, in the books, he becomes the next Batman. So I kind of said, well, my voice is going to sound a little like his now. So that was a good transition. Were there, were there any episodes that particularly surprised you two? In the writing, in the direction, in the way they took the character? Well, I just loved how they really got into Batman's mind, into Bruce Wayne's mind. All those episodes where I would play in a dream, like perchance to dream or dreamscape, where I had the opportunity of playing alternate versions of myself with my father's voice or my own younger voice. And then there would be these 
incredible dialogues within the character. Um, those were really beautiful scripts and complicatedly written. Uh, I loved acting those. Any actor loves being challenged. And a lot of those scripts gave us a real opportunity to sink our teeth into something. And, and also, I, I love this little piggy when I got to sing. <laughs> that was a lot. We did use the fans in uh, WonderCon not too long ago with the song. <laughs> can, you, uh, can you give them a taste? Am I blue? Am I blue? Ain't these tears in these eyes telling you? This is extraordinary. 
and then to hear a full symphony score. Um, everything about the show was was just amped up, and I think it amazed all of us. Okay, Lauren has no thought on that. <laughs> uh, what he said. <laughs> Two-part question. The first one's for uh, Kevin, and the second for both of you. Um, Kevin, since you become almost inseparable from the voice of Batman, did it, did it at any point cross your mind to have your name legally changed to Bruce Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> and for both of you gentlemen, if you could have played any other major hero or villain, who would it be, and could you give us an example of how you would have done it? Uh, I haven't thought about changing my name lately, but um, I have met people at Comic Cons who are named Bruce Wayne. <laughs> Intentionally. <laughs> um, people ask me a lot what other hero you want to play, and I always say, what other hero is there? <laughs> because he's this complicated, dark anti-hero. He's so screwed up. <laughs> but out of all of that anxiety comes this incredibly wonderful man. So I mean, you know, he's he to me is the ultimate hero to play. So it really is a and, and for me it was uh, you know my favorite my favorite role was Nightwing of all time and I they didn't do enough episodes to really flesh out uh, that story and I would love to go back and, and do that and really flesh that out in his further even further transitions. The Nightwing series. Again, social media. <laughs> uh, Redhead kid standing, coming out of his feet right there. No, you. Okay, let him ask it then. Stand up, state your name, sing your school song. <laughs>
Harley Quinn here. Hey, what are you looking back upon that time? <laughs> That's not the voice anyone was expecting. <laughs> What is the difference between a Batman and an animated Batman? Do you, you consider yourself a Batman or an animated Batman if you think there's a real difference there? Well, I think that actually, that's an interesting question. I think that the animated Batman is, is Batman. I think that's going to get... I think that's the real problem for the live action films. Is, I don't know if it really translates to live action. Because there's something, when it's in that three-dimensional, you know, hard-edge live action world, it's just different than when it's in that beautiful art world of Gotham and Batman, you know? There's just something about the animated character, it just, it just belongs in animation. And I think the animated stories have always been better. And I think they should do an animated feature film. And it was my 
wrong. It was my, it was my escape. And you're the reason I get out. I said, well, look, wait a minute. Let's put something in perspective here. <laughs> I said, you're the reason you're here. You're the reason you got out of that situation. And God bless you for it. But isn't it wonderful that that man was there for you, that the character was there for you? So that's what you were saying about that. that we hear stories like that all the time, all the time. Child coming out of the seat right there. <laughs> change in style towards the end of the series. Uh, do you know about maybe the reasoning behind it, but also if you took that as an opportunity for a different take, or if you had to make a different take on the character since the designs were changing? Well, the thing about the voice is it has to be consistent. If you change the voice or alter it in any way, the audience will hear it in a second. And it's something, it's funny about people's auditory sense. If you lie, they hear it right away. And so I've had to really be consistent. The trick for me for 25 years has not been how the character has changed. It's been to keep it fresh and keep it authentic um, over that period of time, which has really been a challenge. You don't want to get you know, boring. You don't want to just phone it in. You want to really live it each time. Um, but the challenge has been keeping it fresh. They did change the distinction between Bruce Wayne and Batman when they changed the style of the show a little bit. Uh, they had me, originally, the distinction between Bruce Wayne and Batman was much more marked. Uh, Bruce was much more of a playboy, there was a lot of sarcasm, a lot of humor. Uh, there was much more color to his voice. And they had me tone it down because they wanted, them, they wanted the whole show to be darker. And um, so they, they, they still wanted the difference. They just tone them down a little bit. Well, they opened up, the show was really opening up, you know, to include a lot more Batgirl episodes. Mm -hmm. and, as I said earlier, Nightwing. And, and it, it really had so much further to go. And it was unfortunate that in those days, there was kind of a, a written rule that, and, and Gary, you could probably address this better than I. But they, it was a written rule like, you know, we do a certain number of episodes, that's it, and then we move on to another show. And so that show could have gone on and on because they were completely opening up. But they said, no, we've reached X number of episodes, and we're done. And yeah, most shows only got 65. Most shows got 65 episodes if you were good. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing time. Well, why did they, why did they stop? Why was the cardinal rule that the show's doing well stopping 65? You know? Syndication. I think it was the main yeah, part yeah. of it. Exactly. But, uh, Expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so you, it's you, all about money. You can, you can amortize reruns, and that's the number they figured. Of course, it everyone out. here come in with an extra dollar that day. <laughs> <laughs> been, you know what? You all got $10. Uh, we can make that time. Uh, we'll make three minutes of an episode. <laughs> all right, I'm going for somebody way into that. The one waving his hand back and forth with curly hair and slides. Well, there we go. Deal. This is great. <laughs> There are some technical things with the series that need to be resolved. 
You don't want just the DVD. It needs to be remastered. So um, it is something that's under consideration. It's something that we've always wanted to do and just let's see if we can make it happen. But don't. I'm not telling you what's happening. I am not telling you what's happening. I'm telling you it is definitely something everyone wants. Hashtag Batman Blu-ray. <laughs> Why wouldn't we? You know, it's the greatest. It's the greatest. What are you here for? Yeah. And you're watching on Blu-ray, right? Yeah. Are, you, are you going on Amazon Prime and watching it now? Yeah. Very good. It's going to be better in Blu-ray. <laughs> when and if we can make it. So, hang tight. And we have one more question. One more question. Who's got the best question? <laughs> All right, Nightwing. Yeah, you. Well, the Arkham series was such a great series. And I've got to say, um, I don't want to ruin the end of it if anyone has already not done it. But the way Arkham Knight ends was so awesome. I loved doing that acting. I loved the challenge of it. You know, taking Joker in to myself and allowing myself to become infected. It was just, I had no idea that that was where it was gonna go. And then to sort of, as an actor, go, go with that, to sort of embody both the Joker and Batman. I just was, wow, this was, I had so much fun doing it. I was really proud of that. And for me, it was uh, playing Man Bat, and that moment when, the, when Man Bat is first revealed on the, uh, the side of the building, Everyone has told me it's the scariest moment they've ever had video like that. Yes! <laughs> All right, so, I want you to stick around because I think uh, this guy is coming. <laughs> He's done his share of uh, Justice League stuff for us, and we love him for that. But in the meantime, I want you to say thank you to Lauren Lester.